There's a whole bunch of ways that we can go with this message today. Now, by the way, my title for this is Know Your Why. Now, just think about that a minute. Know Your Why. Whole series, sermon series, probably just out there waiting to happen with this. But I want you to take a look at this clip that I'm going to show you to start it off. One of my favorite comedians, Christian or non-Christian, is a guy named Michael Jr. If you have not heard Michael Jr., you need to tune in and watch some of his stuff on YouTube because, number one, he's hilarious, but number two, he's, he's just got this message that's rock solid. So let's take a look at this clip real quick. How do, how do I know? I know? A, lot a lot of people, people when they think, think of the phrase, phrase how, do how do I know, they always, they always want to put the what behind it. How do I know what I'm supposed to do? The, the, the question that you really should ask is how do I know why I'm here? Because when you know your why, your what becomes more clear and more impactful. If you know, like for instance, um, people know that I do comedy, but that's what I do. My why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. So I can do comedy, I can write books, I can be in a movie because all of it is motivated by my why. In fact, I have a new, uh, a new web series out called Michael Jr. Break Time. Uh, we probably just did the sixth episode. It's on YouTube. So every single Wednesday at 3 o'clock, we drop a new episode on YouTube of Michael Jr. Break Time. What it is is it's me. I travel around the country and I do stand-up comedy in case you didn't know. And in the middle of my comedy set sometime, I'll stop and just talk to my audience. And we've been filming this, and it's, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. So we're in Winston-Salem. I'm going to show you a clip from Winston-Salem. And I'm just talking to this guy in the audience, and he tells me that he's a, a, a musical instructor at a school. So I was like, all right, you're a musical instructor. You know, can you sing? Let me hear you sing a song. So this is what happened at the last episode of Michael Jr.'s Break Time. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right. So um, let me get a couple. Let me get a couple bars of like uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Go ahead. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That bro could sing, you know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Uh, now, once you give me the version, is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick, if you know which version I'm talking about. Just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing. Here's what I want you to catch. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what becomes more impactful because you're walking towards or in your purpose. Isn't that awesome? So this is what I want us to all wrap around this morning is this whole idea of understanding our why. Because when you understand your why, there ain't no mountain high enough, 
There ain't no valley low enough. There ain't no river wide enough that can keep you from, and you fill in the blank. When you know your why, you have a reason to be driven and a reason to keep moving and to keep going. It may be when, when you recognize your why in your relationship to the Lord, there's nothing that's going to keep you from getting to him. Or it may be your purpose. When you know why God put you on planet Earth, you may say there is nothing that's going to keep me from accomplishing that purpose. Obviously, with God's will. Our mission, our people. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's a person that God, God has put on your heart that you know you just want to see come to know Christ. And you're inside, you just got this fire in your belly that says, there just there ain't no mountain high enough, valley low enough, river wide enough. Keep me from getting to that person. So that's that's where we're going this morning. So to repeat what he said, <clears throat> when you understand, or when we understand our why, our what becomes more clear. When you know your why. Your what becomes, as he said, more impactful because you're walking toward it or in your purpose. You know, I, I get, sometimes I get frustrated when I see people that are just sort of going through life and they're not living with purpose. They're just sort of drifting. I don't want to go, wait a minute. Do you not get that you were put on planet Earth for a special time, for a special reason, you are created with the design and purpose in mind by the God of the universe. And there's lots of examples in this in Scripture. Um, when you think about them, I was thinking about, um, and my list just kept going. You think about Noah, for example. Uh, his what? What was Noah known for? Building a big boat in the middle of a desert that took a hundred years to accomplish. Ridiculous. Until you understand the why. God had said judgment is coming and I am providing a way of escape for all of humanity. And then it says, eventually God shut the door. Do you know that? Do you ever notice that in the story of the ark? God shuts the door. Noah didn't shut the door. The animals came to Noah. Noah didn't go out and round them all up in some giant roundup. But the whole purpose of it, what was, when we understand his why, was to save the people of the world and God's creation makes a lot more sense than just a guy building a boat out in the middle of a desert. What about David? You know, here's this kid who killed a bear and a lion. He's a shepherd, pretty obscure job and position, but God has allowed him to do that. He's become a pretty skilled uh, warrior and hunter, but he, he goes out and he comes face to face with a giant named Goliath. Remember that? Now, the, the what is David taking a lunch to his brothers who happen to be out on the battlefield? That was the what. The why was God was orchestrating his steps to go out to see this giant and the famous phrase, is there not a cause? He's saying, how dare this defiant giant stand here and belch out his insults toward the nation of Israel? Is there not a cause? Then you know the rest of the story. And the rest of the why is that he would become the king of Israel and he would remain as one in the line of Christ, the great, 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 whatever grandfather of the Messiah. That was his why. How about <clears throat> Daniel or Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego? It's all in the book of Daniel. You know, you read their story. 
And you know, the well, the Daniel thrown in a lion's den. <clears throat> you go, why, God? Well, Daniel happened to be able to lead a revival because of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're thrown in the fiery furnace. And you go, the what is, you're about to become an order of fries. But there's a much bigger why behind that. Look at what it says in verses 16, 17, and 18 of Daniel chapter 3. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. They were told they needed to bow down and worship his idols and bow down and worship him. And they said, we're not going to do that. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace... The God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. I love this next phrase. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the images of gold or the image of gold that you have set up. <clears throat> We think God's going to save us. But if not, we're still going to remain faithful. And you remember the story? They look in. First of all, they, they get the furnace so hot that when they're fight, throwing them in there, that the guys throwing them in get burned up. And then the king looks in and he goes, wait a minute. Didn't we throw three guys in there? I see a fourth guy. And he looks just like the Son of Man, meaning he looks like Jesus, whatever he, however he knew that what Jesus was supposed to look like. And then the cool part is they come out and they go, they don't even smell like smoke. Their clothes don't even smell like they've been in a fire. And, of course, that led to salvation of a nation. How about Esther, a Jewish gal? She, the king has married her. He does not know that she's a Jew. There's a guy that's, that's anti-Semitic, and he's got this whole plot to kill off all the Jewish people in the land. <clears throat> and so Esther's uncle comes to her and says, listen, you may have been put here on planet Earth for such a time just as this, as we'll see here in a second. But if you're quiet... The people are going to perish. So the what of the story is, she was a Jewish gal living in the king's palace. But the why was to save the nation. Look at what it says in Esther chapter 4, verse 14. It says, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. I hope I'm speaking on God's behalf right now to you. You were put here for such a time as this. God made no mistake when he brought you into this world and he brought you here, he said, you are here for a purpose. And you will be satisfied and fulfilled when you are serving that purpose that I have created you for. It doesn't have to be big and dynamic, and it doesn't mean that you're going on a foreign field or that you're going to become a pastor or that you're going to give up whatever it is you do. But it is you saying, I know that God has me here to raise up my family. I know that God has me here to impact my culture. I know that God has me here to step into the lives of this generation and the next generation. How about Nehemiah? Nehemiah. The what of Nehemiah, <clears throat> he was a contractor. He was a builder. But the why of Nehemiah was to restore Jerusalem. And thus, I carry on.
the line for the line of Christ. In Nehemiah it says, he, he, they, they tried to set up a plot to get him away from rebuilding the wall. They rebuilt the entire wall in 56 days. What an incredible project. <clears throat> but come to Nehemiah, and they try to plot, uh, set a plot to get him away so they can kill him or so they can do harm to him. And I love Nehemiah's response. This is God protecting him. He says, I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. You understand, sometimes the world wants to distract you from your why. And sometimes you need to say, I cannot go down because I'm doing a great work. I'm doing something important, and I have to stay by it. And then in verse 11, he says, they, they threaten him. They say, we're going to take you out if you don't come. You're dead. You're toast. And they're mocking him, and they're ridiculing him. They're cursing at him. And he says in verse 11, should a man like me run away? I love that character. Scream and threaten all you want. But I know my why. See, if he had known just his what, he could have given up. But he knew his why. He knew why he was doing what he was doing. He knew that there was a higher calling, and he was living by it. Jump over in the New Testament. What about Stephen? Here's a guy who has been as faithful as faithful can be, <clears throat> and a group of God-haters, basically, along with Saul of Tarsus, get together, and they stone him to death. And as he's about to die, he looks up to heaven, and he says, Dear Lord, I don't hold this to their account. And, of course, you know the rest of the story. You look at it, and you go, well, Okay, that's the what. Now, what's the why? Well, God <clears throat> used that in a series of events to change the heart of this Saul of Tarsus to become Paul, the author of most of the New Testament. Or how about Jesus? I mean, we could go on and on with all these different characters, but... Um, Saul himself, you know, Saul, who starts out as a religious guy, but certainly anti-Christian, is met by Jesus, and his life is transformed. All of a sudden, he starts to live in his why, not just his what, or Jesus. The what is... That Jesus, number one, really existed. Number two, that he died on a cross. Number three, that he was resurrected from the dead. Now, that's a pretty big what. Well, what was his why? What was his why? Why did God come to earth in human form as Jesus? Why did God leave heaven Come here, take a sinlessly perfect man, and let him walk on this earth for 33 years. What's the why of that? Well, let's look at it. Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. When somebody, when somebody comes to you and they say, um, I think Jesus came to be a good teacher or to be a good example, uh, just to be somebody that, that gave us a role model on planet Earth. You go, baloney. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to do what we couldn't do. We were lost. We were perishing. We had sin on us that we couldn't do anything about. And Jesus came to be our sin bearer. The Old Testament is full of giving us examples of this process in motion. In Luke chapter 4, in verse 18 and 19, the very first sermon that Jesus gave in his hometown, <clears throat> he gets up and he quotes from the book of Isaiah. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me 
Now, the people are probably going, oh, blaspheme, blasphemer. How could you say that? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, <clears throat> to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Those that were religious in the area were in shock that anyone would make such a statement. I mean, basically, he's saying, I am the promised Messiah that God has called to come to this earth. Here is my purpose. He just lays it out for him. And then I love the passage in John 3.17. We always hear John 3.16 quoted, but I love 3.17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Now listen, Christian, sometimes we come across, like we think Jesus came in to condemn everybody on the outside. That's just not true. He said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came that the world might be saved. So his passion and his desire, his why, is that as many people as are possible would populate heaven. People say, when do you think God is going to, when do you think the Lord's going to return? I think when the very last person that could stand to be in heaven with God is saved, then the Lord will come back. We look at it and we go, oh, this world is getting so wicked and so evil and so bad. The Lord's got to be coming back soon. <clears throat> I go, maybe when the world gets wicked and bad and horrible, it's going to drive people to him and to the cross. So you see the difference in the mindset? Don't walk around looking at people that are different than you are or feel differently about certain political views or whatever it is, as the enemy, look at it as people that need to be reached and need to understand the love of God. Somebody asked me one time, say, how can you, how can you stand to live in an area that seems to be uh, so godless? And I said, it's awesome. I mean, it's for down. You know, if I lived in Atlanta, Georgia, I'd be bored to death because are saved. <laughs> you know, you live in the Bible Belt. That's a yawner to me. To me, this place where people actually need and want to learn about Jesus. Jesus came that the world might be saved through him. And who do you suppose his hands and feet are? since he's not walking on this earth anymore. We are. We're his conduit. Because he's put the Holy Spirit in us, we are the ones carrying that message forward. So here is his why as it applies to us. Listen carefully to this, especially if you're on the fence between whether this Jesus stuff is real or not, listen to what it says in Romans chapter 5. This is the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, who has now come face to face with Jesus. Here's what Paul has to say. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, when there was nothing we could do about our sin, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the What's that word there? Ungodly. What? Christ died for that person and whatever it is, whoever just came to your mind. Yeah, he did. Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. <clears throat> That's the other person you thought of. Usually yourself. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God, there's that one of those but aspects that Trevor talks about, 
But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. How much does God love you? Well, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Whoo! You mean it's not after I clean up my act? No. While you're still the pig wallowing in pig slop, <laughs> when you're still in your stuff, Jesus comes and says, I'm dying for you. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? In other words, once you're his son, once you're his daughter, you're signed, sealed, and delivered. Sounds like another song, doesn't it? You're his. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more... Having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? So, don't keep living like you were because you're a new creature. You've been set free and you are now his beloved son or beloved daughter. The second thing that I want us to consider this morning is, is the why am I here? Now, no, not why are you here in church, because I'm sure some of you are wondering that right now, too, possibly. But why am I here on planet Earth at this time, at this moment? And this is a really big why. See, because here's the thing I want you to wrap around. Why if we have the promises of, of heaven and eternal life from God... Why doesn't God just call us home immediately after our salvation experience? Do you ever wonder that? God, why would you leave me in this mess? Why didn't you just call me home? Well, let's see what Scripture says about it. Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork. You are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He said, I've given you a purpose, and I just want you to live that out. And that's to do kingdom business. This is to do good works. This is to do stuff for me. In John 17, 15. Jesus is saying, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Ooh. That's a good prayer, isn't it? Don't take me out of the world, but keep me from the evil one, please. See, Jesus says, you are salt. You are light. That's what we are to this world. The world around us is living in darkness. It says, you are the light of the world. So our goal is to be living out that purpose, that why that God has put us here. In Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, it says, the Great Commission, as he's about to launch, I mean, you know, I, I love the whole imagery of Jesus He's been resurrected from the dead. He's gathered disciples. They're all standing around. And, and he's about to go off like the space shuttle. And they're just awestruck by this. And the angels come to him and say, why are you standing here looking around? There's a job to be done. Get moving. But he says in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, he says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So he says, go to all the nations. Baptizing. When you read the word baptized, don't, don't picture just of dunking somebody in water. Substitute the word immerse. Because it makes, it deepens the meaning of this passage. 
Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I command you. There's the obedience part of this. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. That's the Great Commission. So when we fully understand the why, we should be compelled to reflect the love of Christ to as many people as possible. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, it says, For Christ's love compels us. When was the last time the love of Christ compelled you to anything? Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. We were dead. You understand that? There is, there is no secondary ticket to heaven. There is no, oh, yeah, I understand about Jesus, but, you know, I, I mean, I've, I got all this church stuff I've done, and I'm a pretty good person, and, and uh, isn't that worth something? Somewhere, maybe, but not when it comes to God's heavenly standard. Because God says, I can't even let a single lie into heaven. <laughs> I'm toast then. All have died because of sin in our life. And it goes on. It says, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised again. So why are we here? To fulfill God's purposes. Jesus said our why very simply. We talked about it with Sunday school class this morning. I mentioned it. <clears throat> Here it is. You want the formula that Jesus gave? Love God. Love people. What am I supposed to do with my life? Love God. Love people. Pretty simple. John 15. 12 and 13 says, my command is this. Love each other as I've loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down one's life for his friends. So when we really get the why of our life, and we see people all around us who need to know the love of God, need to know Christ, and to know that they have the promise from the God of the universe that they can spend eternity with him. If we really believe that, there wouldn't be a mountain high enough or a valley low enough or a river wide enough that can keep us from sitting on the message that God has given us. You know, a quick side note, when I took the presidency of this group called ACTS, International Association of Christian Colleges and Schools, the what was that I was supposed to figure out how to help schools and orphanages in third world countries and developing countries and in the United States if it doors opened up just to get better. I mean, that, those literally were mar marching a, uh, papers, and the guy that nominated me for this presidency his parting words as he went off to take the presidency of a college in New York said, don't screw this up. Oh, thanks, buddy. Gotcha. No salary. Just, you can make this whatever you want it to be as God leads. Great. Okay. Super. <laughs> but the why <clears throat> really came from two questions that you've heard me say before. Richard Stearns first asked these questions in his book, A Whole Letter of Gospel, as he was about to become the leader of Compassion International. And then I quoted in my book, On the Edge of Eden. Here are the two questions. And then I'm going to add a third to it here in a minute. First question is, what if there are children who will suffer somehow because I fail to obey God? 
By the way, that doesn't happen to be just on the foreign field. What if there are children who will suffer somehow because I fail to obey God? That's arrow number one that got me. (laughs) Number two, what if my cowardice, I could add to that, my excuses, my whatever, what if my cowardice costs even one child somewhere in the world his or her life? When I was first invited to go to Uganda, uh, God's honest truth, I had to go home and look up on the map or pull out Google Earth and see where Uganda was. (laughs) I knew it was in Africa somewhere. Would I be attacked by lions? Would I be eaten? You know, do they kill guys for showing up and trying to share Jesus? I don't know, but I knew that if my cowardice cost one child his or her life somewhere, I didn't want to be responsible for that. And here's my third one. This has more application for here and now. What if a single person that God has placed in my path or on my heart dies, and just to put it bluntly, dies and goes to hell because I squandered the opportunity to tell him or her in a compassionate way about the love of Jesus. What if? And notice I said that in a compassionate way. Because there are a lot of people that view evangelism as a separate quarter and a separate thing that only certain people do. And it's like being an insurance salesman. You ever had somebody come and try to to share Jesus with you like they're selling you an insurance policy? Doesn't that make you want to puke? Now, for some of you, you may have come to Christ because of that insurance salesman. But listen, and if you're an insurance salesman, forgive me for that, but um, you, you know what I mean. You've, you've had those guys. How many of you remember A.L. Williams? A.L. Williams, those guys, that was a cult. My goodness, man, they wouldn't, and they wouldn't leave you alone. I had a friend that I actually lost my friendship with because all they want to do is tell me about this A.L. Williams insurance policy. I just said, like, time out, just leave me alone. We don't want that to be the case with Jesus. Not everybody that comes into your life or crosses your path at the restaurant or the airport or the, 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 the flight attendant or the waitress or whatever, not everybody God has placed there for you to tell about Jesus. But there will come a time and a place when you know that God has put you in the path of someone to build a relationship with and to love on and to love them into the kingdom. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with also learning how to be a better evangelist and to share Christ. That's a key part of what God wants us to do. But you don't come across like my presentation is more important than you and me seeing you come into the kingdom. And here's the last thing that I want us all to get. There ain't no sin big enough or pit deep enough or chasm wide enough to To keep God from getting to you and from loving you. You may think, I'm too far gone. You don't understand how deep in the pit I am. You don't understand how far away from God I am. I feel like I'm here and God is up there. There is nothing that can keep God from wanting to get to you. Our response has to be, yes, Lord, I'm inviting you in. You see that last 
little phrase I put up there. It's just the words of the song. There ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no valley low enough. Ain't no river wide enough. Baby, if you need me, call me. No matter where you are, no matter how far, just call my name, and I'll be there in a hurry. And I bet you never saw Jesus saying that in this song, did you? But what if he says that to you? Just call me. Call out to him. Lord, I need you. I'm lost. I can't make it on my own. And I need a Savior. That's the gospel message. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love us so deeply. I love the fact that you have put within each and every one of us a why. You have put us here for a purpose. Maybe some of it put here in this moment for a purpose. Your what is, I came to Island Community Church this morning, but your why may be because today is the day for you to say, yes, Jesus, I need you. And I'm accepting your sin payment. I'm accepting your gift as mine. And this morning, I'm putting my trust in you, not in myself. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you set me free from the penalty of sin and death. And this morning, I'm trusting you. For others, it may be that God brought you here this morning for you to hear and to move you away from your what to your why. To begin to ask the question or begin to focus on why have you placed me here? What is your desire for me? How do you want me to live out my life? So, Father, this morning, I pray that we might focus on our why so that our what will become clearer. Now, just a moment ago, you said that prayer with me that, yes, today is a day that I need to receive Christ as my Savior. I've not done that before, but I think the why I came in this place this morning was to accept this gift of eternal life that Jesus has offered me. If that was a decision you made this morning, I would be so honored to pray with you. I'm not, I'm not going to call you out or make you do anything special, but I just I would be so honored if you just slide your hand up and put it right down and just let me see that for a second and, and then we'll, we'll be through it. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. So for everyone here, that why may have been just that very moment. Is there anyone else would say, yeah. I think that's why I'm here this morning. Just like your hand up right now. Father, we thank you for giving us a why for our life. In that. May you help us throughout this week to remember these words and to think about what you've called us to. May we go out and may we love you and love people as you've called us to. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name.